Uh, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship on the, the, the sixth Sunday of Easter. A special welcome to any who might be visiting or any who are here for the first time and a warm invitation to come for uh, refreshments at the close of our service, which are served outside the, the, the West Hall. Uh, apologies for my voice uh, and for any coughing that I may do during the service. Uh, I've got what is known as man flu. Now, I gather at 8 o'clock there were those who didn't, re didn't know the term man flu, didn't know what it is. It's, it's when men complain they've got flu and their wives say, you've got a cold, get on with it. <laughs> it's man flu, so I'm suffering a bit with man flu. So apologies for the voice and uh, any coughing fits that arise. Um, notices for this, uh, for this morning. First of all, the flowers today were donated by Mavis Smith in memory of, of Dr. Davidson. After today's service, as you go for coffee, there's also a, a bake sale which has been organised by the youngsters in CCY and that all proceeds are being donated to our project Loads of Love. So please come and, and support that. Uh, looking further ahead, this Thursday at 6 o'clock you'll see an invitation by the trustees of the Hayden Trust to join them for a service of songs and praise for Ascension Day. So that's this Thursday at 6 o'clock at the Hayden Trust Chapel. You're invited to bring a chair or a blanket or hat or water, whatever. That's this Thursday at six. And then looking slightly further ahead, on the 4th of June, 4th of June, the Bermuda Overseas Mission are looking to organize a lunch following worship. It's for the funds for Bermuda Overseas Mission. So if you'd like to put that in your diaries now, 4th of June following, following our worship, and David will have tickets available by next Sunday. Let us worship God, let us sing to his praise, in 154, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, in 154.
you, bad as you are, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise, to join with your whole church in heaven and on earth, the whole of the Church of Scotland, your church here on this island, your church in the world, gather to proclaim you as creator and sustainer of all. You are far from us, distant, your dwelling place eternity, hidden, and yet you are in our midst, present where we gather, present in our everyday lives. O oh God, we worship you, for by ourselves we could not know you. No human wisdom can discover you, no argument lead to you, no enterprise reveal you. In the wealth of all its information and knowledge, the world fails to find you. Yet you came to search for us in the frailty of a human life and trusted yourself to the fragile faith of wavering disciples. We praise you that it is in our very weakness that we can know you, that stumbling blocks can become stepping stones, and the foolishness of the cross, the very truth that awakens us to life. Yet we confess, O oh God, that we turn away from you and from your ways, and breathe the proud spirit of the world a spirit which scorns your ways and boasts instead of its own cleverness, uses knowledge, information as a means of power and seeks to prove its worth by belittling others. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O hidden God, your wisdom unsettles our values and compels our love. Fill us with a desire to search for your truth. Enable us better to discern your presence in our lives, that we might grow closer to you and so closer to one another in the transformation of our own lives and of this your world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have the children down to the front just for a little time. Now, the question I have for you this morning is, do you ever argue? Do you ever argue? Who argues? Okay, who do you argue with? Your sister, right. And who do you argue with? Your sister, yeah? Who do you argue with? Your sister. Your sister. Your sister. Now, who do you argue with? Your friends, because you don't have a sister, so you have to find someone else to argue with. <laughs> your brother, yeah. Oh, Ooh, your dad. And your mum. <laughs> you listening, dad? Yeah. Your brother and your mum, okay. Your brother, yeah, that figures, that figures. Well, I guess we all kind of argue at times that the big thing is to decide who you're going to argue with. It's just one way of talking to one another. And why do we argue? Why do we argue? What do you argue about? Right, if you get ice cream in one bowl is bigger than the other. Bedtime, that's a favorite. It's time to go to bed. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Go to bed. Yes. Toys, argue about toys. Right. We can argue about all, all, all sorts of things. And uh, what's the outcome of your argument? Tell me. What happened at the end of the argument? They were both evened out. Well, there's a good solution to an argument. 
They were both, they were both evened out. And what happens when you argue about it's time to go to bed? I know what happens. You get sent to bed because dad's no best and mum's no best. No, you can argue with me now. <laughs> You waste time brushing your teeth. That's a good tactic. That's a good tactic. <laughs> Just find ways of put it, putting it off. We can argue about all sorts of things. And sometimes it's a bit like an argument that we're going to be talking about in church later today. But it wasn't so much an argument. It was more of a kind of a, it was more a, kind of a discussion right, between a great teacher in the early church, a man called Paul. And he went to a city called Athens. And he kind of argued, kind of debated with them there, discussed with them there about the God that he worshipped and the gods that, that they all worshipped. And he tried to get, listen to it. Sometimes arguments are solve things, or debates or discussions solve things, like getting the ice cream leveled up so it's the same, so it's the same in each bowl. Sometimes discussions solve things, sometimes they, sometimes they don't. And Paul, in his discussion with the people of Athens, it didn't, didn't really sort things out. They still had their way of doing things and he had, of worshipping, and he had his way of worshipping. They had their gods and he has his God. And you know, after he gave them this long sermon, he didn't really change their minds very much. But people's minds were changed. And what changed their minds was not what he told them about God, but how that changed his life and the lives of people who were part of the church. And what really changed their lives is the way they looked after others, especially people who were poor. And the, the world that Paul lived, if you were poor, you really weren't looked after and you weren't cared for. And one of the things the church did in these days was it looked after these very people. And it was that that persuaded people to become part of the church, rather than Paul's discussing or debating or arguing. And, you know, I think that still is true today as it was then. It's not so much what we say, it's what we do. And that's why we're all delighted today that you have helped organize this bake sale for CCY because it's one way of the church caring for others who are not doing so well, people who are homeless, people who need a bit of help. So thank you for doing that because, you know, people will look at that rather than anything I say. People will look at that and what you do and say, wow, that's what the church is about. Maybe that's something I'd like to be part of. So thank you for all that you're doing for that. And we hope the congregation, I'm sure the congregation, will support your bake sale, which takes place in the hall after our service. Now we're going to sing a, it's a lovely hymn about the world that God has made. I don't think the words have been printed out for you this time. So if you go back beside your, back to your seats to your mum and dad, because they'll have the words in the hymn books. And we're going to sing hymn 150, 137. 137, all things bright and beautiful.
we'll just remain standing for a blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here this day, may they go with your blessing, knowing your love and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our worship with our reading from Scripture, our first lesson this morning, famous sermon of St. Paul uh, to the people of Athens. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the New Testament. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, from verse 22 to 31. You'll find it on page 137 in the New Testament section of the Bible. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has, a fi he has fixed a day on which we will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And all of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. <clears throat> the second reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, from verse 13 to 18. You will find this on page 234 in the New Testament section of the Bible. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. For in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Amen.
the choir will sing the anthem, What Wondrous Love Is This? The Gospel for today is the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14 and at verse 15. It's part again of the farewell discourse of Jesus with his disciples and the promise to them of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Page 109, where Jesus taught them, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while... The world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them 
and reveal myself to them. May God bless to us the reading of his word and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 489. Come down, O love divine, seek out this soul of mine. Hymn 489. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to reflect this morning on Paul's visit to Athens and, in a sense, on the life also of the, of the early church. Paul had spent a, a time in a number of different communities establishing churches there. It was largely done initially through the synagogue. That would be his, his, his place of work, although moving out to the Gentile audience as well, but establishing these new communities, this young, primitive church, and which extended to all strata of, of society. But now we find him in, in Athens, a place of... Uh, great philosophy, Greek philosophy, the perhaps center of Greco, Greco, uh, Greco Latin thinking, Roman thinking, a place of the Stoic and the Epicurean philosophers. And there we see him take a completely different approach. We find him in front of the Areopagus, in a sense debating or 
preaching as, a, as an orator to the crowds who would have been largely made up by philosophers and those regularly seeking to engage in, in truth and, and philosophy. And so it's a very different approach from his work-based, synagogue-based, where he would, he would tend very much to relate the Old Testament and the Old Testament fulfillment being in, in Christ. In his speech before the philosophers of Athens, he uses a different tack altogether. He really talks about God as being both creator and preserver of life. He accepts that the, the Greeks, the philosophers there, they are a religious people. There are, there are statues everywhere. Uh, there are places of worship. They, they're not irreligious. They are genuinely seekers after, after truth. They have gods whom they worship. And in that context, Paul talks about the God whom he knows. And that is a God, I say, of, of creation, a creator God, and a God who, who preserves life, something which, which his audience can identify. And it's only at the end of that passage that we find any reference to, to Christ whatsoever. He quotes from the great Greek poets when he talks about how we live and move and have our very being in God. That's a direct quotation from one of the from one of the Greek poets. He's trying to establish, if you like, dialogue with them, uh, to meet them culturally, to, be, to see where they are, to find where they are, and to, and to engage, engage with that in what might be called a reasonable and civilized way. I use that phrase especially because yesterday saw the opening of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, which meets during this week. And the Lord High Commissioner is always appointed, the representative of the Queen, the Lord High Commissioner is appointed by the Queen. And this year, she has appointed for the second time Her Royal Highness, Princess Anne. It's only the second time a member of the, well, it's the first time that a member of the Royal Family has served twice in the place of Lord High Commissioner. And in her address to the General Assembly yesterday, she referred to the Assembly as a place of reasonable and civilized debate and something that was much needed in today's world where people instead can very often stridently shout at one another about their own particular position and, and philosophy or, or faith. A place of reasonable and civilized debate. Not always. And I have shared, I think, with some of you before um, a particular occasion or incident in my own ministry where in what I thought was to be debate with a colleague we were talking about how we seem to come to quite different views on a particular social issue. Um, and I thought I would take a different tack as to why we did come to different views, rather than trying to justify mine against his justifying his view. I took the approach, maybe we need to better understand why it is that the two of us, both ordained ministers, both trained theologically, uh, working together in the same presbytery, sitting together at worship, sitting together at communion, why is it that we come to different views on this particular social issue? And maybe we need to spend time trying to understand why that is the case. And he said to people, it's very straightforward. He said, I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> and that was the end, I have to say, of reasonable and civilized debate. <laughs> but what I want to do this morning is, is take you back through the centuries, not to the time of Paul, but to the time following the, the Reformation in Scotland and a, and a picture of the, of the church there in the context of Her Royal Highness's comment about the church being a place of reasonable and, and civilized debate. Post-Reformation Scotland, there was a great desire to, in a sense, ensure that the faith was imposed in a very orthodox fashion. There was to be no deviation from it, no questioning of it because correct faith led to correct works and good works as would be reflected in God's kingdom. When we say the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the reformer's desire was that indeed God's will be done in Scotland through the work of the church and the reformation. So orthodoxy was key to that and there was to be no deviation from it. I suspect the name Thomas Aikenhead is not very familiar to you. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Thomas Aikenhead. In December 
1696, just at the close of the 17th century, he was an 18-year-old student in Edinburgh. He was the son of a surgeon in the city. And he was called before the courts and tried for heresy. He was reported to have declared that theology was a rhapsody of feigned and ill-invented nonsense. That the Old Testament was Ezra's fables and the New Testament the history of the imposter Christ. Now he was 18. And if you go and talk to some youngsters in schools today in secondary school, you might get something not terribly different as they kind of kick over the, the traces. But for that, he was hauled before the, the, the courts. He pleaded for mercy. On the grounds of his youth, he expressed contrition and solemnly promised to make amends. Nevertheless, he was found guilty on Christmas Eve and condemned to be hanged. His body to be buried at the foot of the gallows and his movable estate forfeited. Reasonable and civilized, 18 years of age. It demonstrated the commitment of the Church of the Kirk to root out sinners and what they called free thinkers and cleanse the land of those who were arrogantly offended or who arrogantly offended against God's law. And, you know, we still see some of that in our world today and there were those who might adopt the same levels of punishment given half the chance regarding those that they regard as offending against God's laws. Discipline was key. As we reflected briefly at our session meeting the other night, one of the main roles of a Kirk session of the elders of the church was to impose discipline on the members of the parish to ensure that they behaved appropriately and to also ensure that they were punished appropriately if they, if they failed to do so. One crucial aspect of the discipline was called the testificat. testificat. And if you were to move from one parish to another, you had to get a certificate of good behavior signed by the minister who would carefully research it before you were able to, to move and perhaps take up a position or employment there. And one of the reasons for that was to ensure that no one who was due to be hauled before the church courts could escape off to, a, to another parish. I mean, hauled before the church courts was something that was, uh, was not uncommon. But as we move through the 18th century, the state was no longer prepared to back up the sort of legislation of the church and impose civil penalties on those that the church felt had transgressed. And so as a result, the nature of the transgressions that the church would haul you before kind of narrowed somewhat. And it was almost always in terms of wrongful sexual behavior. Occasionally, profaning the Sabbath, you know, doing on the Sabbath things that shouldn't be done, Occasionally, drunkenness, but by and large, um, inappropriate sexual behavior, of which it seems there was quite a lot, and, and especially on certain occasions. Um, New Year's Eve and Shrove Tuesday, before the beginning of Lent, <laughs> where we learned that many were those who engaged in that wonderful Scottish word, Hochmagandi. How many of you heard of Hochmagandi? Well, you have now, Hochmagandi. I mean, just the very sound of it kind of illustrates that this was getting up to nonsense. Um, and there was a lot of Hochmagandi went on on New Year's Eve and on, and on Shrove Tuesday. And when that did go on, those who had uh, engaged in it were called before the church courts. Fathers of illegitimate children were regularly called before the courts and at first would almost always deny paternity, but then under investigation would pretty much own up to it uh, within a month or so. Um, two thirds of those accused of paternity outside marriage eventually admitted to fatherhood within a month. And then how did the church deal with them? Well, reasonably, the admission involved agreeing to contribute to the support of the child for a period of several years. One would have thought very reasonable. 
but also to endure public rebuke and the humiliation of appearing before the congregation on a number of occasions before the session was finally satisfied that the sinner was truly contrite and could be absolved. Three appearances before the congregation were formally required in church for what was described as simple fornication. We're back to Hochma Gandhi, I may say. So three appearances in front of the whole congregation for that. Six for a second offence. Six for a second offence. Twenty-six for adultery. And you were deemed to have to appear before the congregation in sackcloth. Church's enforcement of discipline. Ah, ah, but not for all. You were also fined 10 pounds. And of course, the majority of the poor couldn't afford the 10 pounds. But the elite of society, the landowners, the gentry, the landed elite, they always just got off with a fine. No public humiliation, no rebuking in front of the congregation. At their position kind of saved them from that sort of ordeal. The landed classes. They could offend, it says, with impunity and escape with a token payment to the poor fund of the parish. It says, for example, it gives illustrations here. One Alexander Robertson ignored demands to appear before the session despite fathering three illegitimate children by three different girls. Likewise, the Earl of Caithness, the Earl of Aboyne, and the Earl of Weems all produced illegitimate children around the same period, but were not subjected to any public discipline. And so you have this picture of the church seeking to impose discipline on the members of the parish, uh, but just some members of the parish, the masses, if you like, uh, those who were generally poor, the elite, the landed gentry, they got off simply with, with paying a fine. It's interesting how in a relatively short space of time, from the very end of the 17th century, when Thomas Aikenhead, the 18-year-old, was hanged for what was regarded as blasphemy, by the middle of the 18th century, we've moved into the time of the Enlightenment and some of the great Scottish thinkers and a desire for free thinking and for exploration of theological and philosophical issues. A rapid change in a short space of time. And so the power of the church to impose the sort of discipline that I've described was very much on the wane. But there was another part of the Kirk Session's responsibilities which was to continue for a much longer period of time. And that was concern for the poor of the parish. And we found there that it had been part of the church's remit, actually long before the Reformation, going back to the 12th, the 15th, the 15th century, a desire to introduce legislation. But interestingly, legislation that made a distinction, a distinction between those who could earn their livelihood and others who had to rely on charity. Only the second group, the crippled, the blind, the sick or weak, were allowed to beg. The first group, those who were fit for work, work had to be found for them, or alternatively, they would be imprisoned or banished. And as the years passed, we come into the 16th century, and two things happened. One, a beggar was given permission only to beg within his own parish. And what that was emphasizing was the responsibility of his parish to look after the poor. It became a parish, a church responsibility. And then in 1574, we had the basis of what became the, the Scottish Poor Law, an act concerning the punishment of strong and idle beggars and provision for sustenance of the poor and impotent. So again, that distinction was made between those that were fit for work but just didn't do it, and those who were generally requiring to be looked after. And one historian of that time writes of this, of the, the work of parish churches in the 18th century. Parishes regularly put the old and infirm on pension rolls, supported orphan, orphans by boarding them out, paid for the schooling of these children and others whose parents couldn't afford school fees, arranged for the care of the insane, made contributions towards the cost of surgery or nursing, joined with other parishes in supporting poor students at the university, and intriguingly, 
buried paupers with a reasonable allocation of ale and tobacco for the mourners, while claiming whatever personal property these paupers left. It's a kind of snapshot of life in the Scottish church as it moved from the late 17th century into the 18th century. And these two aspects of it, one, the, the desire to impose discipline and behavior on the members of the parish, at times clearly severely, uh, a use and abuse of power, but at the same time, a genuine concern for the poor of the parish and how they were to be, how they were to be cared for in, in their distress. If I take you in closing back to Paul in Athens, it's interesting that his great speech to the philosophers of Athens, the Stoics, the Epicureans and others, elicited very little by way of response. It's not how the early church grew. The early church grew because of its concern for the poor in its midst, doing some of the things that were being done by the church all these centuries later. Because one of the aspects of the early church was it would bury those who were just left to decay on the streets of their towns and cities and showed a real concern for the poor in their midst. Perhaps to say nothing has changed today when one assesses the life of a congregation or the life of a church. It's maybe not so much what it says and certainly what it doesn't seek to impose in the days of very much of free thinking and philosophical inquiry and, and youngsters engaging in, in different ways of examining faiths and, and religions. I think what is much more likely to influence people is the work that the church does. What does it have at its heart? Loads of love. You know, it's not an optional extra. Bermuda Overseas Mission, it's not an optional extra. These things belong at the very heart of church life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To the tune, St. Peter, we sing hymn 624. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love. Hymn 624. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings to us in our lives, for all that enriches our lives, we give you thanks. For the love and support of family and friends in our daily work and life. For the fellowship of your church and the sense of communion that we find there not within simply our own congregation, but within this island and the wider church of the world. 
the Church of Scotland as it meets this week in General Assembly. We reflect on the address of the moderator finishing his year, of the lack of care for the homeless in a society like Scotland, unchanged in some 25 years and with a lack of political will to address it. The church's work amongst the homeless and the needy. And we reflect on the homeless on our own island and in this your world, in countries and places of great affluence, but sadly in places of war and of conflict, giving rise to the millions of refugees without a home at this time. We pray for the work of your church amongst them as it seeks to bring a, a measure of hope into lives that have in many respects become hopeless. And we pray for the work of your church in those parts of the world that are struggling with drought and poverty and hunger. The millions who go without at this time, again in a world of plenty. We pray too for our families and our friends, wherever they may be, and ask for your blessing upon them. We pray for those whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time, whatever their need, whether at home or in hospital, those who require to be cared for, those who are troubled and anxious, those sadly whose illness finds no cure. May they know the touch of your healing spirit. And we pray for your church in the world that at the heart of its life may be a concern for others in their need, reflecting your love for them, that compassion, and tolerance, and sensitivity be hallmarks of the life of the church. And we pray too and give thanks for those who are no longer with us, those whose love we were privileged to receive. May we never think them far away, for we share a fellowship with them still, through the mystery of that fellowship we have with you. For all ultimately rest in your life and in your being, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In 622, we sing a love that sets all people free. In 622. And now go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen.